We have a motion from Senator Mitchell. We have a comment from Senator Glazier. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I, I certainly wanted to add my voice in support of this uh, proposition. The administration deserves a lot of praise in a number of ways in terms of their fiscal responsibility. And, and uh, I know our budget is a, a, a lot of value choices and allow a lot of, of, of weighing a lot of a good that's out there. And the governor's good at talking about the good. Um, but on this one, I, I don't, I, I'm still baffled by an unwillingness to, uh, to support this. And so many levels, when you talk about evaluating all those good choices in the budget, it's hard to see this one getting passed first. And uh, I think it's socially uh, responsible, morally responsible, and fiscally responsible. And I certainly join in uh, supporting the, the good leadership of Senator Mitchell. I voted for her bill last year, and I hope that uh, this will be the last time we get to vote in favor of it, because it will be law. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Glazer. Senator Anderson. I, like my colleague, voted for it last year as well. I would, uh, I just want to put some food for thought moving forward. I'd like for us to take a, a, a real effort, too, to ensure that, that uh, we work to ensure that everybody who receives this gets a high school diploma and that we start thinking in terms of building these people in ways that, that uh, they'll be able to provide for themselves down the road and that they will have that positive encouragement and that we make resources available, whatever those resources may be. But I think that uh, uh, allowing somebody to just get by when they have uh, gifts that they need to share with others, whether, whether they do it through academics or other ways, I want to see these people be restored to be, to be everything that they're potentially capable of being. So I think it's a good example for, for children in the family to see parents that graduate from high school. And I think it's good for, for the parents to actually have a high school degree so they can move forward in society. So I would so I'd love to work with the senator down the road on, on that particular issue. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Nielsen. Well, let me attest that this is not a new goal. This was embodied in the GAIN program in the 80s, which was the most significant welfare reform of the era. And the goal was not dependence, but independence. And part of that was to allow individuals to, in fact, complete at least to GED or high school, and to get into job training. And while they were doing that, that they would have child care provided. So they had the resources and means. This is not a new idea. This is a very old idea. And over a number of years, we've kind of weeded ourselves or wetted ourselves away from that. The trend can be back towards that, then it's the right track. The track is independence, not dependence. Thank you, Senator. Senator Block. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just want to say on behalf of the Jewish caucus, this was a high priority of ours this year to see MFG repealed. And Senator Wolk, Senator Leno, Senator Allen, Senator Glazer took a lead in this effort. And thanks to the National Women's Caucus for bringing this issue to us. Uh, um, very important, and Dave was an important step. Thank you, Senator. Senator Mitchell, would you like to? close this out or you've uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity and just very briefly um, I, I just want to remind us all um, Senator Nielsen that nationally um, there was a policy shift away from gain that supported educational opportunities for um, um, former AFDC recipients and that's called CalWORKs where welfare recipients were told to go to work and um, long-term support for educational attainment was not supported under CalWORKs recipients were told to go to work. In California now, uh, we have less time than the five-year federal time limit, limit allowed. And so we have to recognize all that we've put on the plate of the CalWORKs family. They have to go to work. They have to meet certain work participation rates, or we're afraid that we'll lose federal support. And so while I would argue, sir, every CalWORKs recipient I've ever met wants nothing more than to improve their own lives and to create better options for their children, 
uh, we put policies and expectations on them that sometimes prevent them from doing so, particularly a 24-month clock in terms of how much time you receive aid here in the state of California. And so why I, too, um, uh, wax forth nostalgic about the times of gain. We're in a new era with CalWORKs, with new expectations, and I believe the Maximum Family Grant uh, was a policy put in place pre-CalWORKs, and based on that fact alone, it's no longer a fit in our CalWORKs policy. Uh, thank you all for your commitment to eliminating this policy, and again, I'll move the item. Sir, thank you. All right. So just to clarify, the motion is to both approve the 1.4%, 4 4.3% increase to the maximum aid payment, and also then to repeal the maximum family grant effective January 1st, 2017. And as we discussed with Mr. Woolsey, this is using funds from the estimated growth revenues uh, to the child poverty and family supplemental support sub account. Call the roll, please. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Allen? Aye. Anderson? Aye. Bell? Aye. Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? Wynn? Aye. Pan? Aye. Pavley? Aye. Roth? Stone? No. Wolk? The measure passes 13 to 3. Colleagues, our last item under Department of Social Services is issue number 10, which is unaccompanied, undocumented minors trailer bill language. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Wilson. Uh, this issue relates to some actions that the legislature took um, in recent years um, after observing an increase in the number of unaccompanied, undocumented immigrant minors entering the state. Um, those actions included providing some funding for legal services for these minors that were seeking various immigration remedies, including um, one known as special um, immigrant juvenile status. Um, the legislature also at that time um, enacted statute that clarified the role of courts in the state in um, making determinations that lead to special immigrant juvenile status. Um, the action before you, uh, the proposal before you today uh, makes additional clarifications to address some concerns that have arisen um, about um, how the legislature's intent has been interpreted in some cases um, and, and to just clarify those issues through trailer bill. Thank you. Uh, our understanding is there have been a number of ongoing conversations regarding this particular uh, language, and um, at this point, the administration has provided some language, um, which is, uh, we are supportive of that language. Um, we'd note that um, to the extent that any final language is substantially different, there could be some unintended fiscal impacts, and so we reserve our judgment until we see the final uh, language. Thank you, Ms. Costa. So this recommendation is to adopt placeholder trailer bill language as we continue to work out the differences with the Department of Finance. So we have a uh, motion by Senator Wolk. Do we have any public comment? I see none. No comments or questions. Sure, I'm going Senator to abstain Nielsen. until we see language. Okay. All right. And we'll call the roll. Leno. Aye. Nielsen. Allen. Aye. Anderson. Aye. Bell. Aye. Block. Aye. Glazer. Hancock, Aye. Mitchell, Aye. Monning, Aye. Morlock, Wynn, Pan, Aye. Pavley, Aye. Roth, Stone, Aye. Wolk. Aye. Who's counting? The measure passes 11 to 3. So we're moving on to our Subcommittee number four, dealing with state administration and general government, starting with issue 11. That's our budget reserve contribution to be found on page 14. Let's LAO. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ryan Miller from the Legislative Analyst Office. Um, <clears throat> The governor's uh, revised budget includes revised uh, estimates of Proposition 2 requirements of $1.3 billion, uh, a deposit into the budget stabilization count down slightly from the uh, governor's January proposal. 
Uh, in addition, the governor continues to propose a $2 billion optional deposit into the budget stabilization account, the state's rainy day fund. Um, in looking at the governor's proposals these year, this year, uh, our office uh, expressed concerns that they may limit legislative control over the funds. Our office has also uh, emphasized the importance of keeping a large reserve in advance of the next recession. Uh, we would note that the Senate package uh, reflects a larger reserve than the administration's mayor vision. In addition, uh, the Senate package uh, holds the funds in the special fund for economic uncertainties, uh, which would preserve legislative control over the funds. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Ms. Costa. Yes, uh, first I'd like to start by saying the administration appreciates the Budget Committee's recognition um, of uh, the need for a robust reserve fund. I think we've had a lot of conversations here and in the subcommittees um, about um, the likelihood of a, of a recession um, and the need to have a robust reserve fund to um, help the state weather um, those types of downturns. We would note, however, I think the difference here is um, in where the reserves go, um, and in this proposal, it's um, for the, um, the SFEU or the Special Fund for Economic Uncertainty. Our proposal is for it to go into the Budget Stabilization Act, um, which we think is a more appropriate um, reserve um, because of the protections offered um, by putting the funds in that particular reserve fund um, in which, you know, there are several criteria that need to be met um, to really show that there is um, a, a limit actually on the funds that can be withdrawn for that purpose and that there is a true fiscal emergency that um, is a joint decision between the administration and the legislature. Um, further, we believe that the discretionary funds um, that we are proposing to be deposited above the required Prop 2 amounts within the, the BS. SA um, can be utilized for future adjustments and utilizing the funds in this way is uh, appropriate and prudent in years such as this in which we have um, uh, some uncertainty about the economic forecast going forward and we're trying to limit um, the out year cost pressures on the general fund. Thank you, Ms. Costa. So just to reframe this conversation, we all agree, at least at this point, that these one-time dollars which we had not expected to be, should be put into a reserve account. The question is, which account? In response to Ms. Costa's comments, I'm going to suggest that if we thought we should put more money into Proposition 2, our budget stabilization account, we might have asked voters to tell us to do so constitutionally, but we asked them to do it. We did, and they approved it. Now we have these additional monies. Uh, we've already uh, done our required constitutional duty uh, by making appropriate Prop 2 contributions. And with regard to any, and we have greater flexibility by putting it into our special fund for economic uncertainties. And I just want to underscore that there's nothing the legislature could do to spend any of those SFEU accounts without the governor's signature. So unless he's afraid of himself, uh, I don't see that there's any risk. And then I wanted to ask Mr. Miller a question, and this may be a little bit arcane, but I can't help but ask it anyway. Among the many bar graphs that we have seen, I saw one that showed us in the budget year, 1617, with an operating deficit, meaning we're spending <coughs> more than we're taking in, by $2 billion, and that $2 billion of course, struck me as the same amount of money we're putting into the SFEU, excuse me, into uh, as proposed by the administration into the budget stabilization account. I know this is just accounting consideration and, and discussion here, but would we still show that $2 billion red line if we put it into the SFEU as opposed to the BSA? or would it not be an expense and it wouldn't show a operating deficit? Well, uh, I would note that our office has kind of long had at times different ways of displaying the kind of key budget information from the administration. Uh, and we prefer not to reflect that deposit, as you note, as sort of eroding the budget's SFEU. Uh, in fact, if we were to sort of show the administration's uh, identical estimates, we would probably tend to not uh, have that contributing to a deficit. Um, so put it put another way, 
uh, if you had sort of adjusted for that $2 billion optional deposit and the $1.3 billion required deposit, uh, the SFEU would have, would display a uh, small surplus in 1617. So I'm not sure if I asked clearly enough. You've seen that same bar graph with the $2 billion below the line red. And my question would be, if we didn't put that $2 billion into Prop 2, would we still have that red bar below the line? If we put it into the yeah, SFEU. So, so the, uh, the the transfers to the budget stabilization account are reflected as a negative, re just to get technical, sorry, they're, That's what they're we're reflected doing, as a technical. negative revenue right. uh, in, in, our, in the administration's budget display. And so if we didn't have the optional deposit, you would have a positive adjustment of $2 billion into that line revenues and transfers. And so the budget would be roughly balanced if it was right. displayed on that basis. Okay, Ms. Costa. Yes, I can't help myself. Um, Nor you know, could I, so I've invited you. And, and I don't want to get too far into the weeds here. So yeah. um, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I mean, I think there's a number of factors in the out year projections and you've raised one, which is you know what we deposit um, that are one-time funds in the, in, the, in the revenues. But I also think another issue is uh, the multi year forecast between the administration and the LAO is markedly different. Um, and we have higher out year costs in our multi-year, uh, mostly associated with health and human services. So to your point, um, I think there's a variety of factors that are uh, causing the below the line bar graph that you're referencing. Um, and um, reserves are just one portion of uh, the total equation there. Senator Nielsen. Not really tongue in cheek, but I really seriously say so, but with a smile, if there is money there that can be spent, it will be spent. There will be a need. It will be a critical need. And that's the problem with the argument if we do not go into a deficit. If there's money sitting around in any fund, it will be spent. There will be a need. That's kind of the problem that the legislature always faces. There are always critical needs. And frankly, that's not just Democrats, that's Republicans as well. I might want to spend it on the arts. <laughs> so we all have our temptations. Thank you, Senator. Senator Glazer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd be happy to move the item, the staff recommendation. Thank you. We have a motion from Senator Glazer, uh, the staff recommendation being that this $2 billion at one time be placed into the special fund for economic uncertainty. Uh, no public comment, no further questions. We'll call the roll, please. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Allen? Aye. Anderson? No. Bell? Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? No. Wynn? No. Pan? Aye. Pavley? Aye. Roth? Stone? Aye. Wolk? Aye. Ten to five. I think we are absent at least one member, so we're going to keep the roll open on this. Moving on to issue 12, which is the Proposition 2 debt payment on page 15. Uh. Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, administration's revised Proposition 2 uh, estimates require uh, debt payments to total $1.3 billion. Most of that is met uh, under the administration's proposal with special fund loan repayments. Uh, in addition, the administration uh, proposes uh, repayment of Proposition 98 settle up, uh, as well as uh, uh, payments to the UC related to their uh, pension fund. Uh, the Senate proposal would count. Uh, one, a $240 million uh, payment to pre-fund retiree health benefits uh, toward meeting that Proposition 2 requirement and would reduce uh, special fund loan repayments by a like amount. Thank you. Mr. Miller, uh, if you could confirm a memory I have, this was something we, the legislature, decided to do proactively. Nothing required us to do it, this $240 million payment for state retiree health care during our MCO tax reform debate. That's right. Yeah, it's a uh, $240 million payment to accelerate pre-funding of retiree health right. funded liabilities. And the policy question before us is, given that it is a 
payment on debt, which is the reason for one of the reasons for Proposition 2, shall we pay for it out of Prop 2 or out of general fund? And I'll let Ms. Costa speak as to why it should not be out of Prop 2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, as part of the, the secondary portion of Prop 2 here, which is the, the, the loan repayments, as part of our normal course, we review all of the, all of the fund conditions, um, and we did so before the May revise and carefully identified uh, which loan should be repaid. And so our concern with this proposal is shifting the $250 uh, million from general fund to under the Prop 2 umbrella um, can create general fund pressure, and uh, without you know, uh, the underpinning of our analysis on, you know, what the fund conditions are and which loans should be repaid more um, uh, in the more immediate term. Um, we, we worry um, that we could be missing um, other funds that require more immediate repayment. Budget conversations can also always be fascinating, but I, I just wanted to see if I understood your comment correctly. So by saving 240 million general fund dollars, you're suggesting we're putting cost pressures on the general fund. I mean, really, this issue has to do with, um, to, to get kind of technical, and I'll, I'll throw it to my colleague, too, it's a scoring issue of kind of how we um, score our debt repayment under Prop 2 versus the general fund. Um, and as you rightly pointed out, there was, as part of the larger MCO deal earlier this year, um, this appropriation made. Um, and so that that's happening. It's whether or not we score that towards Prop 2. Um, and um, what we've proposed as the payments for Prop 2 is based on our analysis of the different fund conditions and so um, and and based on what the requirements are for prop 2 um, based on our revenues can you remind us what our prop 2 account balance will be with and without that 2 billion that we just voted to put into the special fund for economic uncertainty Why would we consider looking at over four years? Um, with our May revised proposal um, with both SFEU and the transfer to the Budget Stabilization Act, we'd be at about $8.5 billion Eight based on our proposal. So $8.5 billion, and our thought is to use $240 million of that for one of the purposes of Prop 2, which is to pay down debt. Mr. Miller, is there Anything that would prevent us relative to the action we took on the MCO vote to spread this over four years so the impact to the budget stabilization account would only be $60 million a year? To spread the uh, $240 million retiree health payment? Um, well, uh, that was, I believe, a part of the legislation, so you might need to uh, revisit that issue. In addition, uh, the administration has, I believe, scored those funds uh, as current year expenditures. But I would note the MCO legislation uh, did uh, provide instructions concerning another item, the TCRF loan repayment, to uh, score that in 1617. So uh, you may be able to uh, move that into future years. Okay. Thank you, Senator Nielsen. Well, that was a part of the agreement at that time. And now we're kind of changing the agreement, are we not? We're kicking the can down the road, uh, moving the debt further down the road to free some more money up this time. Current Senator Nielsen, I just have to. I was just asking a question. Okay. It's not a proposal at all. Okay, it's I just guess. a question. That was kind of rhetorical okay. context, I guess. <laughs> just want to nip that in the bud. Nip that in the bud, <laughs> Senator Pan. Thank you. Um, First, I, I, can, I, I do have to comment um, in relation to this is that we did, you know, we, we came together to draw that more federal money for the MCO. 
and we appropriately spent on DD. What we did not appropriately do is spend the rest of the money on Medi-Cal, rolling back rates that we cut during the recession. Even as we expanded Medi-Cal, I appreciate the governor's leadership in that, but we have access issues in Medi-Cal. And so now we're decided to take that fund, and certainly retiree health is important, um, but we've now decided to allocate, instead of addressing our Medi-Cal problems, I know some of the money went to help some hospitals with the, the back, um, uh, sort of the clawback issue, which is very important, but you know we're not addressing uh, the fact that we rolled back, even though bef even before we made the 10% cut in the recession, we had one of the lowest Medi-Cal rates. We certainly have the lowest Medi-Cal rates, and we have access issues. So, you know, given that that's not actually what we're talking about, I certainly think it's very appropriate if we're going to say that the funds that we now did decide to allocate that this go under prop that this should fit under Prop Two because this is really about paying down sort of future obligations. Uh, certainly, an obligation we need to take care of as chair of the PERS committee. You know, we're trying been trying to address as well, uh, but I have to, I cannot you know, uh, uh, not express my extreme disappointment that we are setting ourselves up um, for increased health care rates. And we talk about cost pressures because we're shortchanging the ability of people to get health care access now. Uh, it does, it will catch up to us. Actually, in some senses, some of what we're paying for is short-sighted decisions we had to make during the recession for, for, uh, because of uh, budget pressures back then. We're missing this opportunity to try to get ahead of the curve and, and, and taking and, and, and being sure people get the health care they need that will actually reduce their spending moving on. And, and, and so I have to express my disappointment about that. Thank you, Senator Pan. We have any public comment on this issue? Don't know that we do. Okay, Senator Morlock. Mr. Chair, um, I was just curious, what is our retiree medical liability balance? Uh, it's about $74 billion, Senator. It's a two weeks ago, another actuarial report came out and said it was $80 billion. It went up another six. Um, are we using a trust fund? Are we, are we putting, the, if we were to make a, a deposit of 240, would we put that into a GASB 47 uh, or was it 45 fund? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. David Munoz, Department of Finance. To answer your question, yes. Um, there is an OPEB trust fund that is established uh, within CalPERS. It does follow the um, GASB requirements. It is a irrevocable trust. And so we're relying on the CalPERS assumed rate of return? Is that what we're dealing with? As, a, as what, what would be, we would be earning on our money in that uh, OPEB trust fund? So as of right now, um, given the size of the fund, there isn't very much in there right now. There is a, um, a number that is not consistent with what CalPERS uses as a um, assumed rate of return. It's less than that. I don't have it available right now, but we'd be happy to get that for you. Um, and th these are also um, governed by GASB rules as well for these types of funds. So if we owe 80 billion and we assume CalPERS rate of return is seven and a half. That means we're we're falling behind six billion a year. Is that correct? In your example, um, again, the assumed rate of return for what we have right now is not seven and a half percent. But in that example, um, yeah, whatever whatever the liability is times the assumed rate of return, that's kind of like the credit card interest rate. So if it's ten percent, we're falling behind eight billion dollars a year. Um, so this two hundred and forty million is probably spit, but. Um, we're, we're going to go ahead and allocate it over three years? No, 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 no. We are not doing any such thing. Okay, help it's me out. It's $240 million. The question before us is whether it comes directly from the general fund or from Proposition 2. So when are we paying the 240 into the trust? We will be paying it in the 16-17 budget. July 1? Finance? So, yeah, yes, uh, Senator. So the way that the um, the statutes was written written with regard to that 240 million is that um, we take a look at the um, collectively bargained agreements um, 
and by in November for by November 1st 2016 depending on um, the collective bargaining agreements that the administration and the unions have um, come to agreement on based on their percentage of the unfunded liability would mean how much of that 240 million gets allocated to the specific sub account inside of the trust fund which CalPERS administers so we're still lagging by dramatic sums of money. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Morlock. Senator Glazer. Thank you. We have a motion to approve the Senate proposal. No other questions. Call the roll, please. Leno? Aye. Nielsen? No. Allen? Aye. Anderson? No. Bell? Aye. Block? Aye. Glazer? Aye. Hancock? Aye. Mitchell? Aye. Monning? Aye. Morlock? Wynn? Pan? Aye. Pavley? Aye. Roth? Stone? Aye. Wolk? Aye. The measure passes 11-5. Colleagues, we're going to go back to issue 11. We had an absent yeah. member. We're going to lift the call on issue 11, budget reserve contributions on page 14. Call the roll of absent members, please. Bell? Aye. Broth? So that passes 11-5. All right. Thank you for hanging in there. We have four items before us. Next is issue 13 on page 16, the funding infrastructure for state buildings. <clears throat> 